The Iowa City Foreign Relations Council wants to acknowledge and thank its donors, um, members, sponsors, and partners for their support. And this includes uh, the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa International Programs, Honors Program, and the Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, Taxes Plus, City Channel 4 for providing online access to ICFRC's programs along with the UI Library Archives. And of course, our host today, the Iowa City Public Library. Iowa City Foreign Relations Council has adopted the Native American land acknowledgement prepared for the city of Iowa City's ad hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Human Rights Commission. ICFRC recognizes that our home community in Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of ICFRC's um, acknowledgement is on its website at icfrc.org. Now, um, I would have loved to introduce the panelists, and I have something that has been written for me, but uh, what we're going to do for today is to, um, to get them to introduce themselves, because they, they are going to do a better job of saying who they are, and, uh, and then we would, we would have a list of questions that we'll ask them, and uh, so it's going to be kind of panel, and I will be moderating. And we'll try to, to make sure that we have enough time for people in, who are attendant, attendees to be able to ask them questions too. I assure you that the credentials of the people sitting in front here can be very intimidating. <laughs> I've, I've had the opportunity to meet them about three times. And uh, um, I think the continent of Africa is blessed to have them here. So. Uh, thank you so much, and I, I think I'll just go straight away, and, uh, and, and we would uh, ask them to introduce themselves first. Um, and I want you to give us an introduction of who you are, the country you're from, what is your professional calling, and, uh, and what you do as far as um, the Mandela Fellowship is concerned. I'll start with you, Samir. Thank you. I'm just testing. Is it good? <laughs> Can you all hear me? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Shamir. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to uh, the organizers to set up this. It's a big privilege. I'm, I need to say Sunday has given us more credit than is due. Uh, but we are humbled to be here. Uh, to be on this occasion to speak on uh, Mandela Day. Uh, so I am from Mauritius. For those who don't know where Mauritius is, because we are so small, uh, if you look at the map and you see Madagascar, we are just on the right. <laughs> so we'll not miss us. If not, it's very hard to find us on uh, most map. Uh, and yes, it's a small island. Uh, there is a, a quote which some people deny, but I think it's true. Mark Twain said that uh, when God created Mauritius, he created first, and then was inspired, and then he created uh, paradise after that. <laughs> so just a little jewel in the, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so as far as what I do, uh, my background, I'm an engineer, I'm a designer, I'm an advocate for sustainability, uh, but above all, I'm a social entrepreneur. And uh, I have uh, co-founded uh, an organization called Minority Africa, where we embolden marginalized community on the continent through storytelling. And we cover multiple groups, people from ethnic minorities, uh, gender minorities, uh, religious. We also look at people with disability. And what our aim through Minority Africa at the start when we started is to really give a voice to those who normally are not heard. And in mainstream media, you won't find the stories that we covered. 
what they are doing in their community, how they're impacting, and how they're growing. Because every individual, as far as we believe, they matter. And my here coming to uh, the fellowship is very much around going forward with an initiative around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusivity, uh, because there's a high need of that in our continent. I believe that through uh, disintegration, we can really bridge the gap in understanding what is acceptance and how do we create a space for belonging. So that is more or less what I do. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll go to Isabel. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Isabel. Uh, I'm from Angola. And thank you for being here with us and invited us for, for being here. Uh, I am a lawyer by profession and a corporate lawyer, mostly. And I am a member of the executive coordination of Onjango Feminista. It's a women's organization uh, that advocates for the rights uh, of women and girls in Angola. Uh, since I uh, returned to Angola after my studies, I, I could see the, that women are the, we are the most, um, population, but we are the poorest population. We are in the bottom of the pyramid. So um, I joined to Anjago Feminista because we really need to do something to get more girls in schools, uh, to talk about sexual and reproductive rights, um, to, to give uh, the awareness to girls that they can go to do an engineer uh, degree because it's, it's very few girls do that type of courses. And what brought me here was uh, my project. Uh, it's a digital publisher. Uh, I am trying to adventure myself in this, in this project, and I came here to learn um, how I can implement it, because in Angola it's very difficult for a writer to publish their stories. Uh, and the books are too expensive too, and we don't have many uh, culture of reading, so that's why I want to start this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so um, my name is Terence Mawanga. I'm from Zimbabwe. Uh, it's a crown country in southern Africa, a yeah, wonderful country. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever heard of the Victoria Falls of, Z of Zimbabwe. Oh, actually, there's a lot of people. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> okay, uh, for those who have never been, I think you should, you should come through um, and, and see everything that we have to offer. Okay, uh, so in essence, I'm a guy who loves to tell stories. Um, I, try, I, I prefer to identify myself as a writer, I don't typically like to say I'm an author, I'm just a writer. I believe in uh, spitting my mind uh, through, 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 through the medium of writing and uh, just creating something that's beautiful, something that informs, something that entertains, and sometimes, oftentimes, something that rebel, rebels against convention. I'm just a believer uh, that we can change our world one story at a time. So. Aside from writing, um, also a big, big, big passion. I have a big passion for technology. And these days, I'm actually looking at applying technology in the field of healthcare because of a certain personal issue that I encountered a few years ago. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm here for the fellowship, to build a medical technology platform, particularly for the marginalized uh, people in Zimbabwe. But the idea is to really go throughout the African region especially for chronic ailments, um, such as hypertension, diabetes, and eventually to things like um, uh, breast cancer and uh, other ailments in that sort of light. Um, I also believe in the empowerment of young people through the medium of entrepreneurship. So I'm a big believer in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship capacity development. So it's something that I do unapologetically. 
I've done that uh, ever since I was in university, and it's something that I continue to push to different uh, platforms. So when I'm not writing stories, um, I'm writing code through uh, for my um, medical technology startup, or you'll find me talking about entrepreneurship as it pertains to young people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Terence. Um, Rudy? Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rudy Ostia from Gabon. Thank you for receiving us this evening. So I am an engineer by profession. Uh, I did an I have an engineering degree in uh, electrical engineering, but I'm currently working in oil and gas. And apart from that, I am a home furniture entrepreneur by calling. So my goal through my entreprise, Na Africa's Home, is to promote the African cultural legacy through home design and also to empower all the small businesses uh, thriving in this uh, sector. I work with a wide uh, community of African artists and artisans and also suppliers, and so far we are doing good. Apart from that, I'm also a storyteller. My goal is to change the narrative, the African narrative through storytelling. So we, we put our focus on the young leaders making uh, an impact in their direct or indirect environment. And so far, we've been able to collect more than 20 testimonies, very interesting. I hope through this project, I am able to encourage the diaspora, the African diaspora that would like to come back but doesn't know how to identify opportunities in Africa and also give hope to those that are still in the continent but want to leave because they can't see opportunities too. So apart from that, I'm also very active in the youth empowerment. Lately, I've been uh, encouraging young girls to, strongly, to be strongly involved in technical uh, careers because I do it myself. And uh, as a woman working in a very masculine environment, I know how it feels to be the only woman in a meeting room taking crit critical decision and uh, I simply feel that if I made, if I, if I, uh, I made, uh, I found a way to be here, it is my responsibility to make a way for other women, other girls to be there too. Yeah, that's it. Well, you guys have proved my statement right. <laughs> um, uh, this is Mandela Day. This is Mandela Fellowship, and that is why you're here. I want you to tell me, and I'll start with you, ready to tell me, what does the Mandela, Fellowship, uh, Mandela legacy mean to you as a person? Okay, so Mandela's legacy to me means first humility. Because when I think about Nelson Mandela, a great man, he had everything, the connection, the, um, the charisma, but still he decided to step down in 1999 and let another person lead the, the South African country. For me, this is the first quality that I see from Nelson Mandela. And also I see the courage and the resilience to fight for your values, to fight for the, we know that one of the, the, the values that, that was driving Nelson Mandela was unity, equity, and it is very fundamental in a human's life. And the last but not the least, forgive but don't forget. Not because, uh, it, it is not coming from a place of anger, it is coming from a place of wisdom. You don't forget so you don't reproduce the same mistake again. This is Mandela's legacy to me. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so for, so for me, when I was looking at um, ATE's legacy, 
There's one thing that stood out for me. Uh, there's a statement that uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations said on, on occasion of Mandela Day yesterday. Um, so Antonio Guterres uh, proclaimed rather poetically, at least in my own opinion, um, he said something to the effect that um, Nelson Mandela um, was a giant of our time, a leader of unparalleled courage and uh, towering strength and achievement, and a man of quiet dignity and deep humanity. I feel he said it all when he said that. And that for me is what Mandela's legacy means. He, is a, he was the moral compass, not only of his generation, but of this generation as well. And he, what he did is something that I think will live forever. I mean, he fought to, to, to decimate the segregationist um, imperial colonial um, regime that was, uh, that was there in South Africa, you know, the apartheid re regime. But when everything has been, been said and done, after spending 27 years in prison, he still was able to exercise um, a great deal of uh, forgiveness. He also pretty much, you know, he is, he is the flag bearer of reconciliation, really. That's what he speaks to. He, is, uh, he speaks of um, his legacy, he talks of tolerance, he talks of unity and compassion and love and all of those things. So for me, I feel that is uh, what Nelson Mandela's legacy is all about. Thank you. Um, for me, it's uh, tolerance and forgiveness. I think at that time, this was revolutionary, and I like everything that is revolutionary and disruptive. Um, it was something new, and it reminds me what we are doing in this world, which is improve ourselves as humanity. We are, I really believe on that. We are um, building a path. Uh, that's why we we have these old gener generations, and for me, we at, uh, although we continue to have problems, we are better, and we 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 are learning. So this is what he wanted, and for me, uh, humanity improve as human being. It's the the most important. Thing and what I learned from him. That's it. Shamir, I'm sure you have, you have something to say about Mandela's legacy. It's hard to top what my uh, co-panelist has said. But for me, uh, when I think of Mandela's legacy, and I think of uh, someone who has spent more than 25 years in prison. And I had the opportunity to, when I was in South Africa, uh, to visit the, the Apartheid Museum. And they have a replica of uh, his prison cell there. It's a very small room. It's very small, and there is a window there. And it just reminded me about the documentary that uh, Desmond Tutu said about Mandela is, he was not only a prisoner in a jail, but he was a prisoner of conscience. And in, in that time, if we had to put ourselves in this place, he said, like, normally what emerged from that prison could have been uh, someone with anger, someone resentful. But what came out from there was a man of compassion, a man that looked beyond his own suffering and he said something really beautiful that it was, you know, when, when he was able to connect beyond that, it was as if his soul and his body just became one. And for me, that was really touching in how really he, he demonstrated a resilience through that time, trying time. And I look up to that because as a young leader, would I be able to do that? And... That's like for me, that's a really, really powerful inspiration. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you, you brought up the word leadership there. Um, when uh, President Obama 
thought of this whole idea of, of the Mand Mandela Washington Fellowship. He was looking for an opportunity to raise a group of um, African, young Africans who would become leaders. And, and that's the question. And I think that the reason is because you would all agree with me that one of the, the biggest problems that African countries have is that of leadership. And so the question is, what do you think has been, would you say that Mandela has influenced or plays an influence on the country and particularly in your countries, um, in the continent and particularly in your countries? Is there anything you would say that, you know, this is the role or the influence that Nelson Mandela has on the continent or on, on, on your country, in your country? Okay. Yes. Uh, I think yeah, it again ties up to uh, to the legacy that he he left for us, and I would echo with what uh, Sunday is saying. Like uh, one of the biggest challenge we have in uh, in Africa is a lack of leadership, and we as young leader we we question that. We ask ourselves why why is this so, and how can we change the narrative? And every time. As an individual, I like to look at who can inspire me, who is there that can show me a way that things can be done differently. And he has been the, the figure that has inspired through different ways. It's not uh, totally directly in countries at times, but just by his whole presence, it has rippled across the continent and just this fellowship itself, being named the Mandela Washington Fellowship, is already a statement that his impact is already having an effect on us. And coming through this program, we have felt it ourselves. I can speak for, for myself, but I can also believe that uh, all the leaders that are in the room, we have felt this way. It's on a daily basis, we are inspired by each other's commitment to what we are doing. Uh, to what we aspire to do, and how can we just take this step one f uh, more step forward? Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry, I was just, I wasn't stopping you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, for me, um, I think Nelson Mandela and our first president, Agustin Neto, they were, they were contemporary persons, and they shared the same ideas of a, a free Africa, uh, a free people. So we ha I see that in my people, <laughs> although we don't see in our leaderships, but I see it, it in my people, in my colleagues, in my friends, that every day we are in, when we have some um, issue, political issue, we are in the streets talking. Uh, fighting. Um, we are uh, in young girls and boys that build and create community libraries in Angola. We are in uh, all the, 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 the girls who go to the hospitals and help people who are sick or go to the prisons. We are in our bar association when we go to the prisons and we do uh, 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 we help those people who are in prison for a long time. So uh, this is how I, I, I see the influence because the values are, are there, the tolerance, the acceptance, uh, the forgiveness, the resilience. It's the way I see uh, Nelson Mandela. It's in those leaders that I, that I see uh, this legacy. So that's it for me. I'm sure you have an interesting perspective coming from Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course I do. Um, yeah, but maybe I, I want to just sort of add to what um, especially Isabel has talked about, the idea of our leaders having been um, uh, getting along. Yeah, probably, let me say, let me look at it from a historical viewpoint, and maybe I'll shift to more of a social uh, perspective and then end with something that I feel is much more personal. So from the historical side of things, um, I know that Nelson Mandela joined the African National Congress 
which effectively was the movement that was uh, fighting against apartheid in South Africa in 1944. So, um, and he grew through the ranks and I uh, became a leader of their youth movement. So really was passionate about that. And so Zimbabwe, uh, being a neighbor of South Africa, uh, was actually fighting against a similar kind of um, uh, societal malady, if I may call it that. And so there was a lot of rapport between our leaders. Uh, and later on, because ANC was established first before our own liberation movements followed, so there was a lot of interplay, a lot of interchange of ideas. And so when Zimbabwe eventually um, had its own two, two main wings, the Zebra and the Zandla forces that were fighting against the Rhodesian forces, um, the, that's the, the colonial government of the time, and so effectively there was a lot of interchange and Mandela was key to, to, to those sort of discussions that, 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 that took place and there was a lot of um, exchange of wisdom. And even though the NC was eventually banned in 1960, it continued to operate underground and so it continued to assist Zimbabwe in its own fight. And so Zimbabwe's fight for its own independence started around 1966, I think. Uh, up until independence in 1980. And during that time, there continued to be a lot of uh, interchange, up until, of course, Nelson Mandela went to prison in 1963. But still, his influence was very palpable, and uh, he continued to share a lot of his wisdom and insights. And that continued even after independence. Then coming more, coming, uh, more towards the social perspective, Nelson Mandela, once he was released in 1990, and he became president in 1994, the first president of South Africa in 1994, one of his key issues was the idea of trying to mitigate um, the scourge of HIV and AIDS because it was a big, big thing during the 1990s especially. And so what was very interesting, what was happening in Africa during that time and across, across the world as well, was that there, were, <laughs> there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of people, even influential people who were denialists really, who pretty much said HIV and AIDS was not a thing, including some very proper, a prominent figures. And so he was at the forefront of that. He was pushing for more, um, for people to acknowledge that HIV and AIDS was actually a thing and that we needed to follow um, medical advice really to, 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 to survive that sort of storm. And so even though he only served one term and he left office, that sort of spark that he created continued, you know, uh, from then onwards. Because I feel the best leaders in the world, they not only hold on to power, but they are able to create other leaders as well. They're able to create a movement that can outlast them. And now we have seen drastic um, improvements um, in, in, in HIV care in Africa, and the prevalence rates are actually dropping. Um, so in Malawi, for example, there's been a drop by 73%. Um, and then we look at Zimbabwe, Zambia, and other countries, it's about 41%, and I think Eswatini was something like 37%. And then when you go to West Africa, I think Ghana and Burkina Faso, some of those countries that are leading. And so if you look at those sort of, um, if you trace all of it, it has something to do with Nelson Mandela. And when he came out of prison, I mean, during the 1990s, people were listening to him. And so that influence was very much uh, part of that. And then, like I said, from a more personal viewpoint and sort of echo what Isabel was saying, people my age and other people who are slightly older, we know what Nelson Mandela represented. You know, there are political differences in Zimbabwe, there are political differences in other countries. There are business differences, there are tribal differences. People can fight along, I mean, many lines because of many issues. But that sort of combustion, it continues to take center stage and I feel all of it is somehow tied to the example that Nelson Mandela gave us. So yeah, that's what I just wanted to say, thank you. Wow. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the influence of Nelson Mandela in Gabon is very strong because uh, the former president, Omar Bongo, former Gabonese president, and Nelson Mandela had very strong, a very strong relationship to the point that when he was in prison, when he was in jail, uh, Gabon was supporting the ENC and also the, the Nelson Mandela's family. And when he was released in uh, February 1991, uh, Gabon was part of the first countries that Nelson Mandela went to, to visit. 
So even today, we still maintain a great relationship with South Africa. We still have free visa access in both ways. We have uh, schools that are named after Nelson Mandela. This is just to show that on a national point of view, there is a huge influence of Nelson Mandela. And the good thing is that we perpetrate it in both ways. And um, in a continental point of view, I must say that uh, it's a good example. I mean, we all see the way Nelson Mandela has impacted people with such a charisma. We see even the way today African countries uh, manage their diplomacy. We can see that it was uh, in, uh, encouraged by Nelson Mandela because this approach that he made, Gabon is a small country in Central Africa, but still he came to visit us uh, first, which means that you, you have to keep your friends close and your helpers closer. And this is a good way, a, a good leadership approach when you, are, when you want to maintain, build and maintain relationship, especially with other countries. So that's just the, the only point that I want to add to build on what my, uh, my fellows has already said. Mm -hmm. Well, from, from every indication, um, all of you had, you have your professions, but you have started the process of social engineering and looking at social issues and established, uh, some of you have already started organizations even before you became fellows, uh, the Nelson Mandela Washington Fellows. And that means a lot. It says a lot about who you are individually and the way you perceive the problems in society generally and, and in your countries. Um, Having been Mandela Fellows now, how would you say that the legacy of Mandela would influence what you're going to be doing with your organizations uh, when you get back home? In your communities and probably in the country. We see you as our future leaders. Can I start with you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. In Angola, we have an, uh, an expression. We say that, I will say in Portuguese, then I will translate. We say that o pessoal é político. It means that what is personal is al also a political matter. So for us, and what I learned uh, in these seven years that I'm in this organization, is that what we eat, w the water that we drink, if we ch kids are going to school or not, if our bodies are tired, if we have access to sexual and reproductive rights, if we have a job, if a woman is from 6 in the morning until 11 in, in the night selling products to give their children a meal, for me, this is a political matter. So, um, and this, this is a way that we need to look for our realities and we need to understand that we need to practice citizenship, political participation, and this is what uh, we, uh, me and my colleagues and my friends at our organizations do we need to understand that things were uh, not change will not change if we uh, don't participate, and it's not just a matter of uh, voting in the elections. We need to to be awareness to have this awareness of the the citizenship. This is the main thing. I think this for me it's it's the most. The thing that is my, more important for me, it's the, this, this, this conscience of uh, citizenship and political participation. Yes. Um, just, I'm going to, to read something. It's very quickly. For me, true uh, reconciliation and tolerance take place when we all have the opportunity to exercise our citizenship and our political participation. 
Grazie. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, for me, it's very, very humbling. I feel to to talk about Nelson Mandela and then to talk about how his work influences mine, uh, because he left such an indelible legacy. Um, so something that I uh, found particularly interesting because I'm in the technology space is that, you know, across Africa, so many African countries have been ex inspired by his example, such that they've gone to great lengths to, to honor him. You know, in Nigeria, in Burkina Faso, in Tanzania, I think there are institutes either for technology or for science that are named after him. And he himself as well, in 1996, he opened the Academy of Science in South Africa that was dedicated to, to the advancements of science, especially for marginalized groups in uh, in Africa. And so for me, I feel it really resonates with me and the work that I'm trying to do with my organization, Utano for You, which is a medical technology company. So the idea is to try and use a technology, I guess, to try and bridge that gap uh, between uh, those who are able to access healthcare in uh, major cities and those that are not so able to do so. I feel it's something that I'm, I'm taking from, from the example of Nelson Mandela. And then something that, that, that was also uh, wonderful about Nelson Mandela was that he established uh, the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, which was essentially meant to help kids from underprivileged backgrounds to access education, because education is such a powerful weapon. And the ESO idea wasn't just for kids to get education, but for them to actually chart their own course and to get careers that, that would be able to, to help them uh, become the next generation of leaders. Uh, that are empowered mentally, uh, socially, economically. And so I'm taking that sort of viewpoint through Impetus Infinity, which is my uh, social enterprise, where I look to empower young people, um, including high school students who, in essence, are kids, uh, in my, uh, particularly in, my, in the province that I come from, National and West province. So that's the idea, to try and empower them so, so that they too can become the leaders of tomorrow. And then through the writing front, I, I just, I, I loved his autobiography. It's, it's called Long Walk to Freedom, where he talks about his journey. But something that I found very interesting is that he talks about the singular joys of life. I mean, growing up, and um, he grew up in the, Eastern, in the Eastern Cape in an impoverished family. In fact, it was just a regular family in Africa. So many people have the same social, social economic um, they belong to the same socioeconomic class. You know, he talks about going out uh, using his slingshot, you know, to, it's effectively for hunting birds. It's a thing in Africa, especially in rural areas. It was fun to sort of read that. And for me as a writer, so I feel it's the same sort of impetus that I feel I need to tell African stories that are able to inspire other people. And so his example has played a large role in that regard. And before I finish, I want to talk about one thing that I feel is uh, very strong. The idea of Nelson Mandela, when I look at it, and at his legacy, really was to establish institutions that last, and institutions that are multifaceted. When I look at everything that he established, most of it is still in existence. And so being someone who's worked, you know, who, who's working and trying to empower other people, something that I've realized is that uh, there's this almost um, there's this idea, or this ideal, to sort of romanticize donor funding, okay? So there's a classical example that I like to use sometimes. I came across, I came across it somewhere, and probably to sort of explain why I do what I do and to tie it to Nelson Mandela, okay? And so they, there was this entrepreneur, okay, in this village in Africa, and they were doing well. They were selling eggs. They were selling eggs. That was their business. And because they, had a, they felt they had a social responsibility to their fellow people, from time to time, they would give free eggs to their community. That was their act of service. And so uh, this young man did this for a while, and yeah, he continued to cross trade dealing. And then they came a certain donor funding agency. And then um, the donor funding agency realized that these people were poor and they were getting eggs from this entrepreneur. And so what they decided to do, in essence, was to provide a large amount of eggs, let's say, for, for six months, because that's what their client was able to support. And so uh, all the people, they had eggs for six months. 
But then the six months came to an end and the grind was actually over. And then they, they, they donor for, the donors actually left. And after they left, what had happened was that during that six months, this entrepreneur's business had effectively folded because he had no one to sell his eggs to. Mm-hmm. And so their intentions were pure, pure but they actually caused a lot of problems. And now this entrepreneur is no longer, no longer has a business. People have lost their jobs. And these people used to get free eggs from time to time. They are no longer there. And so when I look at that sort of example for me, that's why I, I, I work in trying to empower young people so that they can build institutions that last. Because I feel that's something that Nelson Mandela has all uh, tried to push. And so that's the idea. The idea is, isn't to bring solutions to young people and say, oh, yeah, you should do this. But the idea is to do something that I feel also resonates with what we've been doing through this fellowship, a customer discovery interview. Even if you are coming with an entrepreneurship solution, it should be something that addresses um, um, a problem that someone is, is, is actually facing. And so when I do this through Impetus Infinity, when I try to help others establish their own um, businesses or write their own stories through books, through poetry, and through other uh, means, I always try to make sure that they own their own narrative because uh, it's always better that way. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, before I deep dive, I must say that before doing this fellowship, I used to do things, and I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I was doing things for, uh, from passion, instincts, but since I started this fellowship, now I know why I did this, how to do it better, and most importantly, I know how to name it properly. Um, for me, it's very important because there was a point in my life when I decided that I should stop being a victim and I should start being an actor of my life. And for me now, the idea is to influence other people so they can take that ownership too and decide to become actors of their own lives. And I do it in every aspect of my uh, professional or personal life. So uh, the first thing, promoting diversity and inclusion. First of all, through this engineering career that I have, by including more female in technical field. And also, in my entrepreneurship uh, career, because I am connecting a wide network of African artists and artisans, which means that there is a huge cultural diversity. But instead of using it to divide us, we use it to unify us. We capitalize on it. We can make one item with five raw material coming from five different countries. This is how I carry Mandela's legacy on my business. And also, on the social aspect, I want to continue empowering the most vulnerable. I started doing it before. I I didn't even have all the tools and the skills that I have now. But honestly, I'm just, I I just think nothing happens just like that. Everything is meant for for a reason, for a purpose. Uh, I've been in a situation of extreme vulnerability. And uh, I was approached by a person that offered me to join, uh, I can say, a human trafficking network. But I was lucky enough to be educated. I had a degree. I had a supportive family. At that time, I just lost my father, but I had my mother. That was, she was ready for me, no matter what happened. I had a choice. That's why I had the option to say no and go back to Gabon. At that time, I I, I just graduated from the engineering school in France. And as I lost my father, I didn't see myself going back because I lost a very strong support in my uh, professional career. So for me, I was willing to look for all the possibilities to extend my duration in France and eventually work there. 
But once I, I was approached by that person, honestly, something went wrong in my head. And thank God, I was able to make the good choice and go back to Gabon. A few months later, I started working with sex workers, like giving them advices and influencing them to change that, that uh, career, that, I mean, that job that they were doing to capitalize on other skills. So today, some of them are selling products. Some of them went back to school. So for me, if I'm just able to change one person's life, it's already good enough. And when I look at how Nelson Mandela sacrificed his own life more than 20 years in jail so that more people can benefit. Today, to be honest, I'm happy I have such a great example because we need more of that. Let's be actors in our life and in other people's life so they can be empowered as well. Yeah, that's it for me. That's very inspiring, very, very inspiring. Samir? For me, I think uh, the influence that this fellowship would uh, bring, and I will tie it down to the work that I'm going to do with uh, DEI, and I'll start with uh, diversity. While the concept of diversity is most of the time misunderstood when we speak of diversity. We, 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 we think race, we think ethnic, we think, we think gender, but it is also diversity in thought. And today we had uh, a session where Isabel was with us, but we had also other fellows, and we were trying to solve a problem. It was a health problem. And while our experience back home is very much different, we all wanted to find a solution. Yet there was a, a point where we couldn't really grasp that everyone has a different kind of experience and a different kind of life. We might read about it. We might think we know about it. But until we meet the people who have lived it on a daily basis, we cannot really comprehend that. And while we do that, we need to also be conscious to listen first, rather than jump on and say, this is how you should do it, or this is how it should be done. So when I look at diversity, it's a diversity of opinion bringing it on there so that we can allow space to do that, allow people to be able to say really what it means to be in a particular situation. As for, uh, I'll go with inclusivity first before I go in equity. Inclusivity for me, with the work that we are doing with Minority Africa, we have seen a lot of challenges, especially for people with disability, where opportunities are not given to them on a continent where we have approximately 80 million people with disability. Right now, we, with this, I actually, I'm working closely with an organization that works with people with, uh, who are visually impaired. And we, we designed a, a collaborative platform that would allow people to connect and share these uh, marginalized people's story, different newsroom. But I also made a mistake, and that was not intentional, but it was because of circumstance. We had to build this system and get it out there. And as entrepreneur, we all know we have to get to market or else we won't make it. And the mistake that we did is we did not think how inclusive is the platform. And it's only when I met with that lady and I spoke with her that it got me, it just struck me immediately. It's like, how could we have not thought about it? 
while we ourselves, we do write our stories about these marginalized community, how could we have omitted that? And that, that just got me thinking that in our day-to-day -day activity, while we think we are being inclusive, at times we forget what it means. So intentional thinking has to be at the heart of inclusivity. And it's, it's, it's an, it's, I would say it's more like a habit. Waking every day in the morning and being like intentional about am I being inclusive in the way I'm approaching the day with the people I'm working with, with the work I'm doing, with everything that I am. And for the final part, what I would say for equity, and this is uh, a story about uh, a friend of mine, which I'm currently helping to uh, coach for her. She's applying for a Shivening scholarship, so I'm really hopeful that she, she's going for that. Because she told me on a, on a personal basis, but I'm sure that she wouldn't mind me telling you what she went, like the, the, the impact that she did, is she grew up in, uh, in a family where they told her, like, you know, women are not meant to have a voice. Just go with what is done or said, and that's it. And for a long time, she told me she, that really made her a very timid person. She couldn't vocalize. She, she wouldn't go into spaces and just, uh, just be in a, whole, in, a, in a little bubble. But then in, in her workplace, something happened. It, she was uh, sexually harassed by one of the workers verbally. And that was the snapping point in, in her life. She told me, like, you know, I could have let it go away because that's what everyone around her told her. You know, let it go. It happens. He just didn't mean it. You know, he just, he just said that that way. He says that to everyone. And she told me, I don't know what happened at that moment, but I stood up and I said, enough is enough. I, I can't continue enduring this. And she, it took her some time to complain about it. She had to face... Just imagine, she, she, she was just starting in the organization. She had to s sit with the CEO of the organization. She had to sit with the manager of the organization. And to tell you, the manager of the organization was an HR and she was a woman. She herself told her, let it go. And she said, would you have let it go if it was your daughter in my place? And that really transformed her. And today she's doing really amazing work. She has her podcast that she is... Uh, helping other women come out to, to speak and to really uh, speak about these issues that are not there. And when, when she told me that, I, was, I told her, like, you know, n you have such a skill. Because she felt like, you know, she felt, oh, no, I don't have the, the necessary skill or I don't have the leadership story to, to be selected for these things. And I told her, this is what you have here is really, really strong power. You took uh, an initiative that not only helped you to challenge what was happening to you, but inspire other women in her workplace who then were, had the, the space to come forward and tell her, you know, we also went through this, but we didn't have the courage to do that. So for me, like, when we speak of equity, it's not only a balance of uh, good, but also, like, how do we create these spaces to do that? So I think with this fellowship and the interaction and hearing from every fellows what they have gone through, their experience, it is shaping me to think differently and to go and have a better impact when I go back. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is very interesting. Each time we get to the last person, you link, you link us to the next phase of, of, of our discussion. You, you've talked about um, challenges and uh, most of those challenges in Africa are either going to be institutional challenges, cultural challenges, and uh, you know, political, social, and all of those. And uh, those challenges are going to be there when you go back. Um, the fact that you've been to Mandela, they're not suddenly going to disappear. Uh, you go back and face those challenges as you want to go and actually practice some of the things you have, you've heard us say here. Um, would you mind sharing some of the challenges you see ahead and how you think that 
the legacy of Mandela and the Mandela Fellowship is going to help you. You, you started talking about some of those already, so. But I, I, would, I would like to hear some of the challenges that you foresee, um, probably you have, or you have faced, and how you think you're going to, to face them now. Uh, I think the first challenge that I would see us facing uh, going back is uh, acceptance. Uh, what I mean by acceptance is coming back to what I was saying earlier in terms of how can we see the difference in each other but yet accept it? Because we come from 20 different countries. We have multiple different languages. Even though some of us are from Francophone countries, some of us speak English, our culture is totally different. The food we eat are different. The way we, we go about our dress, you could see like today everyone is dressed in their own culture. It's, 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 it's different. Yet it's, 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 it's a beauty also. And while I, I, I don't want to be controversial and say like some people, but I'll, I'll just put it as some people try to use it as a way to create division. Mm -hmm. This is also a possibility for us to create unity. And how we can do that is by looking at each other and saying at the core, and I think Isabel touched on that earlier, is we are all human beings. We are, all, we are all bound as one in, in our sense. Yes, we have differences, we have all these things, but that's what makes us so beautiful. That's what makes the beauty of all of this thing. But the challenge that we will have is how do we get uh, people to accept that? And for me, I think that is what the work that I'm doing is going to go through that and uh, that is why the DI that we are putting in place is not only uh, for organizations but it's also at the individual level to really get people to understand and wh why we, we, we are trying to go for organization because I'm, I'm sure everyone here we, we have spent most of our life at work our organization shapes most of the way we think and how we go about if you have a culture that is oppressive, we will be oppressive going back home. If we have a culture that empowers, we will empower. If we have a culture of acceptance, we will accept. So it's all about how do we bridge this and get this challenge there. And that, that's the, the challenge that I'm taking on myself. It's a big one, I know. I will be facing a lot of uh, uh, roadblock. But I believe that this is where we can start breaking these uh, systemic uh, barriers in our society and get to the point to now really influence people and influence there. Because if, if you're able to do that as a, at an organization, regardless if it is a profit, non-profit, or anything, you are able to inspire a pe person to go there. Uh, I don't know if uh, I can say that, but I remember watching one thing about the chain of uh, scream command, where the manager would be screaming at his employee, his employee would be screaming at the intern, and probably the intern goes back home and scream at the child, and the child is actually the manager. Oh, no, the child could be like the at a school, mm -hmm. and it just goes back to the manager. Mm -hmm. So it's just the, the, a vicious cycle that keeps going on. <laughs> But if we break the cycle and just show love and compassion at our workplace, then these things would won't happen. And we would just uh, go through that. I'm trying to do that uh, in my organization. And at times, I feel that I'm not doing enough. But uh, if we're intentional about it, I think we can overcome this challenge. Any challenge to share that you think we can? Uh, I think we have much too many challenges. <laughs> <laughs> but when I think of about these challenges, uh, one word uh, comes to my mind that is privilege. 
we uh, we need to use our privileges to um, help other people, and we need to recognize that we have these those privileges, and let it and sometimes let it go, because when we sometimes when we have to do something to change, and we spoke it about it this week in one of our classes. When, it, when we need to do some changes, we need to let it go, our privileges. And this is, for me, it's very clearly. If I, I, I live alone and I have a person who works with me at my house, it, she helps me, but I know that she has her necessities. She, she needs a day off in the week because she has children. She needs to take them to, to the hospital or go to uh, a school meeting. If I don't give her, it, it's not give because it's she, her right. If I don't understand that I, I need to respect uh, her right, I'm not doing anything. So. Uh, when um, when uh, we have a couple and we are at home, we are two, when a man intends that he doesn't need to do anything at home, he's not recognizing his privilege and he, ha he has more time to work to uh, improve in his career than the, the women. So he has more privilege and he needs to understand it and let it go for both of them ch share this privilege. And now doing a link with my project, my, the books project, um, I had the privilege to read books since I was a kid and those books um, are uh, what I am today as a person. So uh, I have this privilege, but I, I need to use it to create the awareness to our uh, government, first of all, because they need to understand that, that all those kids that are out of the education system need to have this privilege. So they, let, they need to let it go, their privileges, to uh, let this, all these people um, have the, the privileges that they deserve to. That's it. Thanks. Okay, um, yeah, I feel like my uh, colleagues have said it a lot, um, a lot of uh, great stuff. Okay, just so uh, maybe I'll, I'll just talk about a um, more business related challenge, I, I guess, uh, something that I feel all of us as Africans share. Um, of course, the economic climate won't be easy for, our, for us when we go back home uh, in order to operationalize our businesses and our ideas, um, of course, um, but um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to make it work. Yeah. Something that I like is the idea of synergies. We've been building a lot of collaboration, this fellows between ourselves, and hopefully we can continue to do that so that we can um, deal with the issues uh, that we're facing, uh, the economic issues, the finance issues. I think we'll be able to overcome those challenges. So um, just to add, um, I had the opportunity to, to, to intern at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa for a little while. So uh, because of that, I was able to pick up a few issues related to trade and um, issues of tax policy and the like. Something that I found very, very, very pertinent, and I feel all of us as young Africans can leverage on, is the African continent of free trade area. Yes, we have our own challenges as countries, but when we come together through the African continental free trade area, I think we'll be able to do a lot of good. 
really. Um, uh, it has recently been ratified, and most African countries have signed on to it, and so it promises a lot of um, a lot of great returns. We're talking about trade facilitation measures, um, the jettisoning of uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade, and if all of us as young Africans can go back and play a part yeah, in making sure that it actually becomes operational, because in, there are still issues with it. Something that I um, that I would like for the fellows to look into is the, there's something called the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System. It's supposed to make it easy for me in Zimbabwe to trade with, um, with the ITF in Togo or with my, uh, with my brother, Romanas, in Namibia. But, you know, there are still issues uh, that, 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 that need to be sorted out. So sometimes it may mean we may have to lobby with our central banks because it's an issue that is higher up than, than, than we can actually work on our own. But if we can do it together, if we can lobby with one voice, I think we'll be able to push together. And it's a matter of working together. It's not a matter of fighting. It's a matter of working with those people who are in positions of power so that we can start to leverage and those benef uh, leverage on that sort of thing. I've heard a lot of people talking about collaboration and synergies, especially my guys who are doing honey. You know, some of them are talking about exporting to each other, and I'm like, this is exciting, this is wonderful. But when you have a, a thriving single market on, in Africa to make everything even, even, even smoother. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, so just to build up on the interesting things that they already said, I'm going to mention uh, corruption as uh, one of the top challenges that we face, first of all as individuals, but also as business owners. And uh, my only comment on that is that as young leaders, we choose to do not, uh, to do not um, compromise ourselves. So we choose to be compliant and to do not cor corrupt ourselves or corrupt anyone. And also, uh, you mentioned a very good point about the trades. Uh, it's very interesting because currently, from what I know, it's in region. So you have the central part, the east and the west, and the south. And the idea for us is to go beyond it, uh, above it, yeah, to be able to reach uh, other fellows, other businesses, even though we are not from the same region. I think that we, we would benefit from it a lot. And uh, there's something interesting that we probably don't want to emphasize, but it's still very important. It's the political status of most of our African countries. Even though we are not directly involved into politics, government is still a key stakeholder in everything we do. And uh, we notice that in many countries we have abuse of power, Recently, in 2020, we had the NSAS movement in Lake Itzolgate, where a lot of Nigerians died. Uh, we have a lack of political transition in Gabon, in Togo, and in other African countries. We, we have a lot of issues. And the only thing that I must, I must say about it is I understand it's difficult, but... I would like us to prefer negotiation and reconciliation as Nelson Mandela did instead of going to war. Because let's think about it. They are stronger. They have been there before. They did it from the past year. They have the network. So as young entrepreneurs, when we go back sometime, we want to raise awareness. We want to denunciate. We have that energy, that power. I just want to, I mean, to remind to all of us that we need to stay calm and <laughs> consider the negotiation first instead of going to war with people that are stronger than us. That's it. Well, I, I, I just have one more question, and I'll open it up because I know that people are itching to ask you many questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In one or two sentences. What's your impression of Iowa City? <laughs> <laughs> Should I start? Yeah, yeah start for you. Me. My impression of Iowa City, um, you say one or two sentences. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because I know that you could speak 
<laughs> uh, wonderful experience and network in quality and quantity. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, for me, I, I come from a very small town in Zimbabwe, just outside Dai. And so when I came to Iowa City, I just sort of felt like I was back home. Yeah. So, um, for me, I like small towns. So for me, it was perfect. Uh, I like trees and see green in everywhere. So I am in the in the um, perfect place. And I learned a lot from the professors and all the people that I met, the, the interns, uh, the people that we met in networking, people much older than us doing so many things and with uh, so much energy. So it's, I'm, I'm feeling very happy for being here. Thank you. Uh, I would say, uh, like Terence, I, I feel like home because this is our summer basically back home. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Iowa is, is a very peaceful place. And I was speaking to Ndagu yesterday when we were coming back and we were just thinking, like, we're going to miss it a lot because it's, it, it just has a serenity around that. The place, the people, and... Also, I would say, like, the people here are very caring and intentional in terms of, uh, I think, uh, you mentioned connect, uh, connection and networking. Yeah, it's, they, they take care to, and they listen, and they make, I would say, extra effort to, to get you to where you want to be. Sometimes, which, it takes us aback because you're like, oh, wow, why are you doing so much? Because uh, it's, yeah, so for me, it's really, really been uh, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll hand you guys over to the audience. And um, we are now going to move into the question and answer portion of, of this program. And uh, so what we'll do is... Um, if we, we start the question and answer program, but before then, uh, we want to thank all our members and donors for their support. And if you would like to join the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council or make gifts to support its programs, uh, please go to icfrc.org and check out one of the sign um, stations in the room today and uh, check out one of those. So uh, we'll go into the question and answer session. That was the first time I saw. Yeah, and I've got a microphone. Oh, you have right a here. microphone. I'll come right around with you. Since we're in a major agricultural state, I was interested in having each of you comment on the role of agriculture in your respective countries. Any of you can start. In my country, in Angola, we have small um, people um, doing agriculture in small, um, small, scale. Yeah, small scale to uh, substance, substantial? Subsistence. Yeah, mm. subsistence, yes. Um, this is one of our challenges because we need to produce more and, to, and stop to import so many things, food, uh, basic food. So, uh, yes, we need to, to work on that. We have some big farms, but they are few, and they are not enough to uh, all of us. So that's it in Angola. And when we say big farms, it's not like a 1,000 acres or something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 50 to 100 yes. acres. That's a large-scale farm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the question. I'm, I'm not in the agricultural sector uh, per se, but I know that uh, Africa is 60% of all arable land, uh, you know. And so we are, the B, we are big on agriculture in Africa. And so I know Zimbabwe is also big in uh, wheat production and corn production. So something that I found very interesting when I go to Iowa is that I was told that corn is used for animals, 
I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not right. But for us, corn, really, we use it to make what we call sadza. Uh, what do you call it in Kenya? The white? Ogali. Ogali. Yeah, gali. And then some in South Africa call it pap. And so it is a big, big, big thing in Africa, in Zimbabwe specifically. One of our top uh, earners uh, brings us uh, probably the bulk of our gross domestic product. Aside from minerals, of course, we, we have diamonds. And very soon, I think we have oil as well. So coming in first in Zimbabwe is something that's nice. But agriculture is a high up there. And then just to bring it to all my feel, for me personally, when I interned with the, with, the, with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, it was because I had written an essay about the prospects of um, the agricultural prospects in Africa presented by agriculture. Okay, so I was linking agriculture to my technological background, and I felt it was a perfect match. Even though I'm not there yet, I think I'll be there in a few years. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be in that space. I think agriculture plays a huge role in Zimbabwe specifically. Thank you. What one would like is that every country be able to feed itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Do you have anything to add to that? Okay, so uh, Gabon is most likely uh, like uh, Isabel described Angola. So we have small scale farm, uh, wood, which doesn't supply enough uh, product for the entire market. So basically, we import most of our fresh products. So recently, the government has put in place a program to encourage people to uh, uh, go to agriculture, but these projects are still growing. They are not at a mature stage, so there's still a room for market penetration or positioning. Uh, for Mauritius, um, agriculture was primarily uh, one of our main economy at the time. Uh, we used to produce uh, sugarcane, which we uh, we exported. We still have a lot of sugarcane across the island, so riding around the island is sugarcane everywhere. Uh, however, now there is um, a decline in the industry because we, uh, we we just produce it for locally and some we export, but we can't compete with the market, with the price that there is in terms of uh, sugarcane. Uh, there are initiatives around uh, farming, especially in uh, uh, like hydroponics, uh, aquaponics farming uh, that are being developed. Uh, and given that we're not a big island, but we are, because of our size and I would, our, our population is just 1.2 million, but we are considered like in Africa to be the most dense country that there is. So um, there is a high rise of urbanization in, in the country which is now, uh, I look at it as an opportunity. Actually, I'm, I already started with my backyard. I made a little crate before I came to the fellowship where I'm trying to grow my own uh, little garden. And I see that as an opportunity to, uh, to have urban farms at your own place and to offer it as a service to communities around uh, because of the way the, the country is moving uh, currently. But we do have a lot of uh, land available that, and especially with the change with uh, sugarcane could like really bring in other other crops for for cultivation. Okay. And just uh, to, to 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 add to what I said earlier on, maybe just to sort of um, clear the air. Of course, there are a lot of prospects in Africa, uh, and especially in Zimbabwe. But we do have a lot of challenges as well. As you, as you talked about, uh, the idea of nations being able to feed themselves, it's just something that we still need to address. So we are still seeing uh, nations that are still buying from other countries, and Zimbabwe is also not exempt from that. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that I'm hoping we can actually address in the near future. But it's true. Um, of course, just to say, just to emphasize, agriculture still plays a, a large role in our gross domestic product as a country. Thank you. OK, we had a question in the back here. Um, thank you. Um, the presentation was, um, the panel was very, very impressive. They said a lot of things, and I have spent the past three weeks with them, but yet they still impress me. So I have a question for Terence and Shamir. Um, firstly, Terence, um, you mentioned that you're in the space of empowering the youth and helping entrepreneurs and also building strong institutions. 
Um, have you tried partnering with organization, whether locally or internationally, to try fight xenophobia attacks on Zimbabweans that they face in South Africa? And my second question is, um, we see a lot of migration um, by a lot of um, Zimbabweans. And I was just wondering, um, since you're a leader and you went through this fellowship, um, what do you think your government can do to try to reduce this migration? Or what will you do when you get back home to try, you know, we're not saying um, people shouldn't migrate, but you'd want them to stay home and rebuild the great Zimbabwe that, they, that we know or we used to know from back then to relive those industries again. And my question from Shamir, um, you spoke about how you advised your friend to, you know, to put in the sexual harassment um, information, piece of information when they were applying for the Shivning Scholarship. And I just wanted to ask you, do you think um, issues of sexual harassment in the workplace should always be dealt with discre discretion to protect the victim, or they should be voiced out like your friend did to raise more awareness, because these are sensitive cases that require careful investigations before a decision could be made. So I just wanted to ask you that. Thank you. OK, um, yeah, so thank you for your questions. Uh, the first one, I feel it's a very layered question, something that I feel is very personal to most Zimbabweans, because we all know someone who is living in South Africa. And at a personal level, I have not been actively involved in uh, issues of um, dealing, say, with, with, with xenophobic attacks. I've mainly been concerned with um, economic issues, uh, but it's something that I'm truly, truly passionate about. And since you have mentioned it, I'm actually going to make it a point to see how I can be involved in that sort of space so that I too can lend my voice and see what I can do. It's a very big issue. Uh, I think it's something that will also involve the governments of South Africa and the governments of Zimbabwe to play a part, because already there have been discussions between them. Uh, but then sometimes some of the solutions they come, come up with uh, seem to be temporary. We need something that's much more long-lasting. But I guess the key at the end of the day is uh, for us as people, I guess, to, to find a certain oneness where we will all be able to belong. Here's the thing. When I was at university in Zimbabwe, we had students who actually came from South Sudan, OK? And so they were surprised when they heard about these xenophobic attacks in South Africa. But they would be wondering, how can one brother treat another brother that sort of way? But for us, we actually accommodated them. And I remember one of them actually became president of our student union, you know, probably in their second year, we voted for that guy because he had sound policies. So I don't know what the social system is like in South Africa, and but it's something that I feel is much more systemic when it comes to issues of um, I, I don't know, uh, of let's say violence in general. Um, in Zimbabwe, uh, relative to South Africa, I guess there is less violence, you would say, but there, that's an issue that has to be analyzed further. I don't have the the, the, the numbers. Per se, but I'm just speaking from my own observations, from what I've seen in Zimbabwe. But certainly, it's something that I will look into when I get back to Zimbabwe and see what I can do as a leader to play to play a role in trying to change that. And then the second thing you talked about the issue of people migrating all over. Yes, we have over a million people. I think in South Africa, we have uh, many others who are in the UK. Some of them are here as well in Zimbabwe. The issue is simple. I feel we have to create the right sort of economic space that attracts people so that they can stay. It's all about the economic prospects. You know, people are going to South Africa because they're looking for jobs. I know that uh, I have friends that I learned with when we went to South Africa. And I remember one of them was telling me, I can't come back home because their parents, their, their mother and father, effectively told them, you can't come back. You have to be able to find something there. And they sort of found something. But with that, there comes the issues of xenophobia and all of those sort of things. But we have to continue to play a part. That's why, for me personally, I feel that the best way is through the medium of entrepreneurship. So the other day when I was giving my talk um, with the fellows, I talked about my own story. My, I'm here today because my mother, Shani, moved from being, she was a vendor at some point, but now she owns her own business. If that transition had never happened, really, I wouldn't be here. 
And so I'm seeing in, in myself that sort of thing. And I don't need to go to South Africa because of the journey that she walked through. And today I'm able to support myself and so many others, you know, all of us. In fact, let me say all the fellows here uh, who, who are supporting themselves by, through entrepreneurship or will support themselves by entrepreneurship. So I feel that's something that needs to happen in Zimbabwe. I'm one person who can do that. But I'm also part of the, it's a USAID-funded program. It's called the Local Wake Zimbabwe Project. So what we're effectively doing is we are going to all the provinces in Zimbabwe, especially the marginalized communities, because that's where most of the people are actually migrating to South Africa and to other countries. The idea is to say, hey, this is your, your, your area. What are your issues? How can we solve them? Once again, the customer discovery interviews, we are not coming with solutions. And then the idea this year, we start the implementation. It's a $5 million project. We've used up $1 million, there's $4 million to go. It's not enough, you know. I, I understand that, but it's the start. It will help, you know, minimize the number of people who are crossing the border. And most of them are doing it using unsafe means, you know, jumping the border, that's what we call it back home. It's not safe, it's not good. And so I feel entrepreneurship is the number one way to, to, to go through that. And yeah, through my institute as well, I hope I can do something. Thank you. Uh, all right, that was a very uh, tricky question you asked me. <laughs> uh, the reason I'm saying it's tricky is because um, I'm aware that uh, sexual harassment, when we speak of it, it's not only subjective to one gender, but to all genders. So while I can speak for myself, I can't speak for you, I can't speak for someone else. So uh, how it should be addressed can be very different depending on not only the gender, but the individual themselves. Uh, however, if I'm, I'm looking at it from a holistic uh, standpoint, I believe that uh, organizations should create spaces that are safe enough for people who endure any kind of uh, harassment to come forward and to be able to speak freely about it. Uh, in that way, then uh, we can start addressing the problem. And I agree, but like, there is always two sides of a story. There is always investigation that uh, needs to be done. But if in the organization itself there is no policy or there is nothing that uh, stipulates what are the steps to do that, uh, it becomes very difficult for the person to uh, to come ahead and to uh, to say what what uh, they experience. So yeah, that that would be my uh, my take on that. Yes, oh. <laughs> lots of hands. Okay, yeah. I saw your yeah. hand first. Thank you. Yeah. I really thank you so much um, for the the presentations. Um, like Tapelo said, you guys have really been awesome. Um, Mandela is quoted as saying, I am not a saint unless you think of a saint as a sinner who keeps on trying. Um, and as students of leadership, we're supposed to learn from both the good and in the bad. Um, what do you think, um, each of you, um, what, what major mistakes Nelson Mandela made um, in your own eyes, like having led and then gone, and what can we learn from that? Um, what major mistakes do you think he made when he was a leader, and what do we learn from that as students of leadership? So moving forward, we can, we can avoid some of those mistakes. Um, I know, obviously, he's, he was a towering figure, right? But at the end of the day, he was still a human. So yeah. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> That's a difficult one to answer. After. <laughs> I think the mistake he made was he was human. <laughs> yeah, does anyone know? No, no. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Um, uh, in my opinion, yes, he was human, and we can see that. I don't like to speak uh, about other people's contexts, but we still have challenges. That means that he had those ideas, but maybe the way that, because when we talk about um, 
those that what happened in the past, uh, we need to talk about it in an honest way. And uh, if I was speaking in Portuguese, I would say it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we need to talk ab about the things in a in an honest way, and maybe the things they are not they weren't discussed how they should be in a more profound profound way. So that's why we are we see even in South Africa we see uh, these problems because we have okay the apartheid ends, but we know the people who have uh, who are in a in a better situation and the people who are in the, who are poorest so i think that in practice um, the problems that uh, they faced before they, they they still they still here so that's that's it I want to, okay yeah. yes uh, I wouldn't say it's a mistake, but I think like, and this is thinking forward, uh, when he stepped down from power, and this is my own opinion, as leader, I, I fundamentally believe that what you leave as a legacy is not the work that you have done, but the leaders that you leave behind. So Mandela left a gap when he went out. And we have been trying to fill that gap for quite some time. So I think if I can answer your question is, how can we, while, yes, doing whatever we are doing in our own field, ensure that we are building other leaders at the same time? So that if tomorrow we are not in the picture, there is someone else that is continuing. And that would be a strong legacy. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll move to a couple of hands that I saw. And um, we, um, we don't have much time. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. I'll come can, to you. Can I add something? No, she was Sorry. Uh, before, before he has his question, I would just like yeah. to... I would just like to just complete uh, on what um, my fellows just said. For me, if I had to point out a mistake, and again, I think from another perspective, it is not a mistake. It's more on a personal side. It's the divorce from Winnie Mandela as he was released from prison in 90, I mean, a few years later, in 1996. So for me, that would be a mistake because that woman was, she, she stood by him. She was fighting while he was in prison. So for me, you don't just separate from such an ally like this. But then again, it's his own personal choice, so I can't really judge. Yeah, that's it. Hello, everybody. My name is Edward. I come from Ghana. I'm one of the Mandela Washington Fellows. And uh, as you can, I can proudly see <laughs> this plane, I come from Ghana. That's, that's our flag. So uh, first of all, I'd just like to say a very big thank you to all the Iowans. Iowa is like a home to all, myself and all my fellow uh, colleagues um, now. And uh, it's been a great time. The Iowans have been very, very warm. They've been very, very helpful, willing to connect you, willing to squeeze time out of their schedule to sit down with you, listen to your plans. And uh, sometimes I don't know if they are pretending, but it's, it's, it's really <laughs> warm. Um, being a businessman, I thought I had to take this opportunity. Um, we, I know that when Mandela came out of jail, uh, that was, it's also marked the revival of. South Africa as a tourist destination. And um, today we've had um, a lot of things, um, uh, some negative, some positive stuff, but I just wanted to make a point that um, Africa also has a lot to give, mm -hmm. apart from all the things that uh, we've been going through. Currently, if you check, you find that um, four or five of the fastest growing economies are in Africa. Uh, and I like to focus on tourism. 
when it comes to tourism, I, I know, I know um, in the U.S., it's, it's like a tradition or a culture. Summertime, families travel to other places, have fun. That's where they bond, experience different cultures, new cuisines. And I'm just extending an invitation together with my, uh, my colleagues that you should start considering Africa if you've not made it to Africa on any of your tourist trips. Um, as we sit here, the fellows in the Mandela Washington Fellowship, we are from 20 different African countries. And if you ever wanted to come to Africa, any of these countries, you can just uh, uh, stretch a hand or send a message and we'll prepare for you. We need you guys to come over to our countries to experience our culture, to taste our food, see our, our beautiful beaches. Um, we have so many beautiful beaches and our food, very tasty. I know they are spicy. We will be there with you to ensure that you don't get into trouble when you eat our food. But there's so much things to do. You may have heard stories about, or you're not sure whether, if you come, is it safe? Uh, trust me. Don't believe all the news you hear. Sometimes they're just, uh, just snippet, little bits all over. But majority, if you go around, I can talk to you about Ghana. You are welcome to come to Ghana. You have a great time if you come. The people are very welcoming. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to just to encourage that put Africa in your plans and come experience our culture so we can, we can all exchange um, some values and also uh, it will bring some money to the continent and help us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you for such inspiring stories and your leadership, your vision, um, your entrepreneurship, your passion for where you live and come from is incredible. Um, in my experience, when I've been had the opportunity to participate in a leadership program, and this is an incredible leadership program with incredible leaders, one of the best things is just getting to meet one another and to spend time outside of your day-to-day -day work and all your families and all the responsibilities you have so that you can be inspired by one another. So I just wanted to, and maybe this is just the right way to wrap it up, um, and you know, you don't each have to answer, but I would love to hear just you know, what has been the best thing about getting to know one another and are you going to be able to continue this fellowship as alumni uh, who can stay connected with one another. Yes. Yeah. What are your plans to I stay can, together? I can. Uh, for me, um, it's the first time that I have this contact with people from uh, other countries of Africa. Uh, I, I have friends from Cape Verde and from uh, Mozambique, but because we speak Portuguese in Cape Verde and Mozambique, we are very few countries that, uh, that speak um, Portuguese, so sometimes we feel a little isolated. Even, our, even with the feminist uh, movements in different countries, we don't have as much contact as we wish. So this is the first time for me. For, it's a privilege. I'm, I'm loving it. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I met, uh, these are very brilliant uh, people, persons, and I'm, I, I definitely want to maintain the contact and uh, our friendship to grow and, yes, to and be here for our continent. So that's it for me. else wants to share? So I'm going to share. So uh, in my point of view, uh, this whole experience is such a blessing. So every day I keep the best of the entire experience. And what I do to make this network last longer is to start discussing business opportunities with my fellows. So most of them we've already been, I mean, since day two, we were already <laughs> discussing business. And uh, for others, I approached them uh, for my personal project. 
which is a book called Back to Change the Narrative. And to be honest with you, I plan to approach all of them. <laughs> so let's just say that I've started with few, but the idea is to approach all of them because I would love to hear from them. I would love them to share their stories so can, they can inspire other young people back home and give hope. Yeah, that's it. Well, thank you so much, Isabel, Rudy, Shamil, and Terence for this excellent discussion session that we got together. Very, very, we're very, very, thank, thank, thank you so much. So this was ICFRC's first program for the summer. Our next program is tomorrow, actually. Uh, tomorrow evening, we have a film screening um, of the new Hollywood film. How do you pronounce, how do you call this? Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. And uh, in partnership with Stanley Center for Peace and Security, it's uh, hosted at the film scene down in the Chancery here. So, uh, and then we will return for the first in, uh, in our fall semester lined up on the 24th of, uh, of August. And our program is going to be at Ocknell, actually, for a program with Oksana, and uh, who will speak about living in Ukraine, uh, my story of an unbreakable nation. Uh, that is going to be a very interesting one. Please uh, check out the programs at, uh, and, and, uh, at our website, and you can also actually go in there and indicate uh, so that we know um, those people who are coming. But it's been my pleasure to host uh, these wonderful people and all of you who are here. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.